Sister Amanda Soloway. Yeah, 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 well, yeah. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And I also want to go yay because this has been an absolute pleasure. This is, as the Honourable Member for Newcastle and, uh, upon Time Central said, it has been the House at its best. And it really has genuinely been a great pleasure. And I have listened to the fantastic con contributions in this debate. And I would genuinely like to thank the, all the Honourable Members for their thought-provoking in input. Without exception, it has indicated how essential central science is to our economy and society. And this has been recognised across the House. So let me expand further on how ARIA will build on the strengths of our R&D system. The proposal to create the Advanced Research and Invention Agency, ARIA, has been welcomed by leading scientists, institutions, businesses and, of course, colleagues today. We have listened to, uh, listened to agencies around the world and consulted the research community here at home. And the Honourable Member for Richmond Park asked about this. And we have, of course, carefully considered the recommendations of the Science and Technology Committee, brilliantly chaired by the Right Honourable Member for Tunbridge Wells. I am confident this is a bold, brave and positive step towards our ambition to cement the UK's position as a science superpower. And one of the things we must be clear about is how ARIA fits into the wider landscape and what it will achieve. My right honourable friend for Tunbridge Wells and the honourable member for Newcastle and the Tyne Central also asked about defining ARIA's purpose. So let me get, have the opportunity to set that out. ARIA will fund high-risk, high-reward research in a different way to UKRI and the rest of the system. And as my honourable friend from North East Bedfordshire highlighted in his excellent contribution, I believe that ARIA will give us something genuinely different drawing from the UK's existing R&D strengths. And in this way, they will reach fantastic people with brilliant ideas that aren't currently funded. There have been several questions on funding where I think the Secretary of State has made the position clear. The Right Honourable Member for Doncaster North, my Right Honourable Friend for Tunbridge Wells, my friend for Havant and the Honourable Member for Glasgow North West raise the question of ARIA's mission and what it should focus on. And it is an important issue and I have listened to the different views with great interest. Climate change has been suggested and this continues to be, to be the uh, government continues to invest in net zero, including through the £1 billion net zero innovation portfolio fund announced as part of the Prime Minister's 10-point plan. I should also be clear that ARIA's programme will each be motivated by a single clear ambition set by the programme manager. However, these decisions will be made by ARIA, and it is ARIA's leaders who will be responsible for strategic oversight of their programme portfolio. They, of course, will be able to speak to researchers, other funders or government departments to help inform their judgment. But there are already UK funding programmes for which ministers do set the strategic direction and ARIA is specifically being set up without those constraints. The Honourable Member for Cambridge, my Honourable Friend for Rugby, asked about the need for ARIA to have a specific customer. ARIA's groundbreaking work will absolutely draw partners for its projects and programmes, but we want to leave the door open for it to forge those relationships across a range of sectors. The Honourable Member for Aberdeen South, the, right, the Honourable Member for Richmond Park and my Honourable Friend for Rugby asked about recruitment of ARIA's culture, about recruitment and ARIA's culture. I recognise how crucial this will be for ARIA and that is why we will recruit a CEO to provide the creative, inspiring leadership the organisation leads, someone uniquely able to build a team of high-performing people. And this will not be on a whim. We will be conducting a genuinely open and fair, renew, uh, re fair recruitment process for a CEO and a chair. The Honourable Member for Aberdeen South and the Honourable Member for Glasgow North West asked about the oversight government will have and the Honourable Member for Midlothian queried of how we will hold ARIA to account. Madam Deputy Speaker, they are absolutely right that ARIA will be a greater distance from central government than we are used to. And that is a deliberate move based on international experience. The evidence suggests that freedom and autonomy is that what makes this kind of agency work. Effective governance for ARIA is something I am mindful of, and it is incredibly important. But it must be tailored to ARIA. Objectives, if we are to, ARIA's objective is to get the balance right, and it is about balance. There are powers for the Secretary of State to intervene on issues of national security to introduce additional procedures to measure conflicts of interest. And these sit alongside powers to make non-executive appointments to the board, 
which will, of course, include the Government Chief Scientific Advisor in an ex officio role. And these are robust arrangements. The Right Honourable Member for Doncaster North and the Honourable Member for Airdrie and Shots, in his commendable final speech, and I wish him the very best, they raise, <laughs> they raise the, the Freedom of Information Act specifically. ARIA will have a very small number of staff, and because of the load it would place on the organisation, we do not think it is right to provide this scrutiny, right way to provide scrutiny. I would like to remind honourable members that departments and public authorities that work with ARIA can, of course, be FOI'd. There will be other statutory commitments to transparency, and the bill makes clear. ARIA will be required to produce an annual report on what it does, and this will be laid before Parliament alongside its accounts. The Honourable Member for Aberdeen South and the Honourable Member for Airdrie and Shots also spoke on procurement. The bill exempts ARIA from obligations on a contra uh, contracting authority in public contracts regulations. But procurement decisions will be taken by ARIA, not by ministers. Because it is one step removed from government, this exemption empowers ARIA talented programme managers and directors. And again, the freedom to act quickly will be, balanced a be a balanced requirement for ARIA to audit its procurement activities and set out in the framework document with the department. The Honourable Member for Cambridge. The Honourable Member for Airdrie and Shots, the, the Honourable Friend for Bolton, North East and West, and many other Honourable Members all made representations around ARIA's location. And I recognise that they, they care passionately about the scientific excellence found in all parts of Bolton, Cambridge and in Airdrie, and of course all right across the UK. But ARIA will be run in a small, by a small number of people. It will have a small physical presence. And we know that the potential CEO and chair candidates will have a high interest in the location of the headquarters. And I cannot commit to the specific location at this stage. But if ARIA is to deliver UK-wide economic benefits, then like UKRI, it should function and deliver on a UK-wide basis. Stakeholders in the devolved nations, such as University of, Scotland, University of Scotland, have been clear in their support for that approach. Madam Deputy Speaker, I will finish by thanking honourable members across the House for their rich and considered contributions. My door is always open, and I would like to invite any members to discuss the bill with me further. We must remember that the United Kingdom is a hotbed of brilliant invention and innovation. The Secretary of State spoke about our proud history of scientific excellence, and I am confident that the creation of ARIA will help safeguard that excellence far into the future. In the last century, the US ARPA funded the ambitious research that underpins the internet and GPS. Technologies have transformed our lives, opened countless avenues of inquiry, and created extraordinary value. These successes don't happen overnight or by accident. They all start with a wild ambition, an ambition that is nurtured into reality against all of the odds. It is this ambition that will course through the veins of ARIA staff and talented researchers they fund. As Science Minister, I have listened to many inspiring scientists and inventors, and it is now my ambition, Madam Deputy Speaker, to give their brilliant ideas and the best possible chance to profoundly change lives and the lives of our grandchildren and my granddaughter for the very better. And I wait with excited anticipation for the remaining stages of the bill.